Welcome to our study and our series of great prayers of the Bible. I'm Dick Baker, your teacher. Glad to have you with us. Today, it is a familiar story, and uh, there's no new twist to this, but I believe there's some interesting things that we can see and that the Lord has for us that perhaps you did not know. But my prayer and my desire with this series is that we all that we all better our prayer life. And so as we go through this, I just, you have my prayers behind you that you would see something, hear something, and the Lord would touch your heart about something specifically. Prayer is very important to the child of God. This is number four in our series, and the title of this is God Be Merciful. And we find this story in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. We'll be reading that in a minute. But our theme verse for this entire series comes from Hebrews. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. All right. Uh, These are taught live to an actual Wednesday night prayer meeting. And this is our Bible study. And so I have some things up front of just interest that goes along with the theme. So keep that in mind. So name the hymn title. I'm going to give you some lyrics here. Mercy there was great and grace was free. That's some of our hymn song lyrics. Can you think of the name of the song? Okay, I'm going to give you the answer, but I'd encourage you if you want to stop the uh, presentation, you can pause it while you think going up. This is from At Calvary. Uh, To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. This is probably the hardest one of them all. The name of the song is He Giveth More Grace. Mercy drops round us are falling. Well, that comes from There Shall Be Showers of Blessing. And here's our last one. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness to all generations. It's uh, one of our choruses that we sing, but it's been a few years. And this one is, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. So I'm not keeping score. I just thought that would uh, get us in the, in the mind of mercy. And that's what we were looking at in the titles and sometimes in the song. Here's our introduction. This is the only gospel which contains this story. And actually, it's, it, Jesus says it's a parable when he speaks it. And so the parable have, has basically two main characters in it, but ultimately there is a a third one, Jesus Christ. So the first one's about the Pharisees. And, oh yes, the Pharisees, they they were not liked. They were really not respected. They were feared. And if people could avoid them, they ran. And they stayed away from them. So the term Pharisee comes from a term meaning separated ones, and that's exactly what they were. They were called to the priesthood. They were Levites, and they were called to serve the Lord. But somewhere along the line, they became more political and more power-hungry than people serving. And in the days of Herod the Great, they numbered around 6,000, but their influence was far greater than their number. So why were they all around Jerusalem? Why were the the bulk of them there? Because number three says most of them lived around Jerusalem. Uh, One, because that was where the temple was. And number two, that was because of the temple, because of, uh, for instance, Herod the Great or the Roman influence, uh, it was all around Jerusalem. They wanted to be in the middle of the power. They wanted to give as much as they could. They abandoned true religion or the true religion of the Bible for their oral traditions. 
They were more concerned about rituals and outward appearances. They developed the oral tradition that interpreted the scripture and were the teachers of the twofold law, the written law, which is the word of God, the Bible. But they forsook that for what they felt and what uh, their predecessors uh, had done. So their ancestors had spent time developing the oral law. Well, we feel it means this. Well, we mean it feels this. And you should not do this. But the scripture doesn't say you shouldn't. And so they opposed Jesus because he refused to accept their interpretations of the oral law. That's what it was all about. They didn't have a problem with him quoting scripture to them and actually using scripture, but as how they interpret it. All right, the publicans, boo, and you'll see why. The term publican comes from the Greek, which means tax farmer. And I suppose somewhere way back when they got that name that they probably were taxing the farmers. But that sort of dropped off along the way for some other things. The publicans at the time of Christ were basically tax collectors, although they could also have roles in supplying the Roman military, managing port contracts, or overseeing building contracts. Publicans weren't employees of Rome, but contractors who were chosen from the upper class people. Publicans were mostly known as tax collectors in Galilee, and Matthew filled that position in Capernaum. Publicans actually won their positions by bidding for them at auctions. The person would name the amount of taxes he thought he could collect, and then he would pay that amount to Rome. Anything he got above that, that's how he lived and how he made, and they made a lot. The Jews hated them. They were unjust and dishonest. They were also Jews who were viewed as, quote, selling out their Jewish heritage, unquote. That's, so that's our two groups. We see the Pharisee and the publican, but Jesus is telling the story. So let's read this out. And I, my class uh, read it out out loud with me. And he spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So he's telling a parable about those that trust in their righteousness and think they're better than everybody else. And they think because of that, they are more righteous and more religious. And they get to go to heaven because of that. But they hated everybody else. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus is speaking, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So our outline is simple. I did not try to make this elaborate. This isn't about how good the outline is, but how much we understand and learn by prayer. We see prideful prayer. We see penitent prayer. What can we learn from these? What does the Lord want to implant in our heart? And so most of the most of these verses, which are not long, deal with that kind of prideful prayer. And he spoke this parable unto certain which, notice, trusted or had confidence or reliance in themselves, not the Lord, not anybody else, that they were righteous and despised others. Despise meant that they viewed others in contempt. They just didn't want to be around them. They hated them, didn't think much of them. Now, that word in the Greek, despised, shows up in other places. 
and it will give you the degree that you can see this. And Herod, with his soldiers, after treating him with Jesus with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. So Herod had bitter hatred towards Christ. Here's a Jewish crowd, Acts chapter 4, the day of Pentecost, and the, uh, Peter is speaking. He is the stone which was rejected by you. It's the same word as you held in contempt. You hated him. You rejected him. And the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. So you rejected the cornerstone. He became that. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. That comes straight from the word of God. And there's no oral law in this one. It is just plain and simple. And the Pharisee needed to catch this and uh, understand. The Old Testament wrote that also. It, uh, the phrasing, it is written, it, it means it is established truth. There's no argument about that. So two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. It's like he's, he's, he was just speaking out loud and having a conversation with God, but also with him because he, I guess he liked to hear himself. Others heard him too. And uh, with himself, and he said, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are. Extortioners were sw swindlers, people who stole by force and violence. Unjust, those are people that just violated God's word. Adulterers, we understand, are even as this publican. An adulterer was unfaithful to their spouse. And he said, even unto this publican. So I want you to uh, notice something. Um, uh, we'll come back to that after we get through here. So his prayer was very prideful. He was self-centered. And the phrase, he was all talking about himself. Uh, and talking about God, that I am not as other men are. And I want to go back to verse 11. And we're going to count five eyes, how self-centered he was. And so look at this. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I, number one, thank you, that I, number two, and I'm going to come back to the second one. Here's verse 12. I fast twice, three in the week. I, four, give tithes of all that five I possess. Wow. So very, very self-centered. Number two, his morality was based on negatives. But what he was doing is comparing. He, he picked really, really bad people, extortioners, unjust adulterers, and he had to include the publican. <clears throat> because in order to be self-centered and to be righteous and to be just pri a prime candidate for heaven and God's favorite is you got to look good. And so he used these things. He had nothing in his heart that he cared to confess. But you generally, I think we all understand and would know, he had a whole lot more sin in his life than the public and coming up. And so we know that the Pharisee uh, switches now to what he is. He says, I do, I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all I possess. Guess what? That's good. That, that, is, that is very good. That's pleasing to the Lord, but we must do it as, with, with the right heart. And so his, see, his worship was based on eternals. People could see him skip a meal because he'd tell them. And he would tithe because he would take it to the temple and give it so everybody could see it. And so he was all about externals. So here's something I found from Warren Wearsby that's a summary of him. The Pharisee used prayer as a means of getting public recognition and not as a spiritual ex exercise to glorify God. He was deluded about himself, for he thought he was accepted by God because of what he did or what he did not do. 
So here's our penitent prayer. And actually the word should be but. And in this sense, but the publican, it's talking about and the publican means that he's just like the Pharisee. But but is dividing and saying now there's something else, but it's different. But the publican standing afar off a distance, but both could see each other, both could hear each other would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the phrase, be merciful, uh, or God be merciful, is, is this, which is, is totally incredible. Oh, God, apply the atonement on me. How about this? Oh, God, apply the mercy seat on me. God be merciful to me. And so we understand that mercy now is found at the cross of Christ and the blood that he shed, but we're still in the old we're still in the, under the law. We may be in the gospels, but the savior of the world is yet to die. It will be soon. And so temple worship was very important that it was done correctly. And part of that worship was the high priest and is the sacrifice for the atonement, not just of nations, but people could bring sacrifices for their sin. And it was the blood sacrifice. And this publican prayed, oh God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Apply the mercy seat, the atonement, the blood all over me. And when he calls himself a sinner, that always literally means one who misses the mark. He doesn't come close to the target. So what about him? He was humble before God and man. He would not lift up his eyes. He was more aware of his own sins than those of others. He, he mentioned nothing about the Pharisee. The Pharisee was not, in the, was not an issue. It was him and his heart and his life. And so he, he is praying, be merciful to me. And he was conscious of his standing before God because he was calling upon the Lord. God, oh God, please be merciful to me and my life. Frederick the Great, the king of Prussia, visited a prison and talked with each of the inmates. This is a hundred years ago-ish. I'll just say that. It's a, a time gone by. And as he went through the inmates, he would ask them, why are you here? What did you do? What is the cause that brought you this direction? And one after another, after another said, I didn't do anything. I'm innocent. My hands are clean. And he would go to each one, to each one. And towards the end, he saw someone sitting over on the side that he got to. And he looked at him and said, and why are you here? What, what have you done to make yourself here? And he looked at the king with, with sort of a half of a bow of a head and said, your majesty, I... I've done a lot wrong. I've, I've hurt people. I've, I'm a thief. And I, what I've gotten here, I have deserved. Frederick continued with the last few, and he had everybody. And as he started, he, he was finished. He started to walk out of the prison with his guards, and he stopped in the middle. And he said, I'd like to just make an announcement and he had the guards bring the man that confessed to being bad and a, and a great sinner. And he said, I've, I've talked to everybody. And all of you, but one, have said you do not deserve to be here, that you are innocent, that you are free, and you should be out of here, back home, back doing whatever it is you wanted to do. He says, but I have found somebody that is has told me and confessed his deeds and what he has done. And he said, logically, and then my way of thinking is, 
why in the world would I want this man in this prison with all of you? Because he eventually will infect you. You will become more like him, not him like you. And so he said, for that reason, I am taking him out of this prison so you all can continue to be righteous. And that he did, and that was a real story. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Jesus says, he's talking to his listeners, for everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So here's some, here's some words to share with you in the last few, and then we'll wrap this up together. And I appreciate you being with us. And this man went down to his house justified. The word justified uh, in the Greek is the word right, as in the sense of an unexpected behavior and conformity, obeying laws, doing what live like we should live. And it is through the justification of, of us, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have become justified in the eyes of God through Christ, not us. We are brought into a right relationship with God. The publican was brought into a right relationship with God. And in this, the Greek is in the perfect tense. It talks about something that happened in the past and completed there, but it's going on even now. It's a legal term. It goes on to say and talks about he exalts and for everyone that exalts himself shall be abased. Everybody that elevates themselves, lifts them up, thinks, I've, I've got to climb the ladder. Uh, we'll become abased. We'll go the other way. And he that humbles himself shall be exalted. And humble means to be brought low. So uh, take it home from the temple. Uh, something uh, to share with you. And then I'll wrap it up with just a summary statement. As God's people, we need to be merciful, as the scripture says, even as your father is merciful. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Ah, so if I want mercy from God, I must give mercy to those around me. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace until in time of need. Two men went up the temple stairs. Both men came down the temple stairs. The one who went up exalting himself went down degraded and described as that one rather than the Pharisee. The one who went up in humility went down exalted by God as described in the proverbial statement by Jesus. These are the folks that have helped me put this together. And if I can be of help to you, this is my email address. Please check out my playlist. Uh, this is the fourth of our great prayers of the Bible. And so if you missed any of them and the introduction, they are uh, under great prayers of the Bible. And you can find all of them and we'll keep adding them. But there's lots of other Bible studies and Bible trivia quizzes, Americana, just check things out. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the example of these men. One is really so tragic. He, he, he at one time had a heart to serve God, but it left him. And so what became important to him is not what was important to you. And Lord, then we met one who, who knew he was a sinner and cried out for mercy. And Lord, when we need mercy, it's there. It is for us through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for mercy at our salvation. 
and thank you for mercy each day as we walk our lives. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, and I'll catch you for our next great prayer of the Bible, number five.